Hi, I'm Joe Mills from Baylor College of Medicine, and I'm here today with Miguel Montero from Houston and Dan Clare from Vanderbilt, and we're going to talk about a hot topic, which is venous arterialization. So the concept has been proposed for over 100 years, but it's recently taken off based on a recent trial with a lymph flow device. Dan, why don't you describe the results of the trial briefly, and we'll go from there. Sure. So the PROMISE-2 trial was an extension of the PROMISE-1 trial. And both of those trials looked at a high-risk group of patients who were felt to have no option for treatment of their critical limb-threatening ischemia by standard arterial revascularization means. And so uh, in both of the trials, but particularly in the PROMISE-2 trial, now over 100 patients were uh, treated with the deep vein arterialization through a transcatheter approach. And in that group of patients, the primary endpoint was amputation-free survival. The amputation-free survival in the group overall was 66%, and the limb salvage was over 75% in the group of patients that were treated. And this is really the first time that a group of patients this sick and with this little of an option for, for treatment of the problem have been treated with this and actually had significantly improved limb salvage compared with a historical control. And Miguel, you've had a lot of experience with this, so you were doing it before the device was available. So could you briefly describe in your experience the kind of patients you pick for this and how do you define no option? In general, I think it's, a, it's an evolving definition what we've come to think of it is those patients that have a pretty dramatic wipeout of the below the uh, ankle vessels where there's high calcification rate. Roberto Ferreresi and his group published a very beautiful paper about small arterial disease, defining these people that have below the knee and even more so below the ankle disease. And then our group together with his, we are actually uh, able to put some data about uh, calcification patterns related to reintervention rates both podiatric and vascular. So we think that high calcification patterns, high stages of Wi-Fi classification in patients that are fragile and have probably poor conduit to begin with are actually good patients for this sort of technique because otherwise you would have very limited options. And so in these, quote, no option CLTI patients, we started identifying this technique as a possibility. And so, yeah, to your point, we started about Two years ahead of the uh, PROMISE-2, we were not necessarily part of PROMISE-1, but we found those patients uh, in our clinics, overwhelming uh, our, our hospital wards, and actually to the point that we were one of the top enrolling groups once PROMISE-2 came around. Uh, and I, I would say on a personal note, obviously now that the data is out that Dr. Claire uh, related to, it's been really refreshing to be off, able to offer something to these patients that normally you would only offer them a major amputation. In this study, uh, Dr. Clare, were renal failure patients included? So this uh, population did include dialysis patients. If they were stable on dialysis for six months, they made up almost 20% of the patient population. And while their limb salvage was similar, the unfortunate thing that we found is that their survival overall is much poorer than the patients without end-stage renal disease. I think that's another uh, area where we need to improve our outcomes. It's great that we can save the limbs of these patients, but we need to improve their survival as well in order to make, particularly for the dialysis patients, this a very meaningful treatment. Yeah, I think for the audience, there's been a big shift in disease from what used to be mostly tibial disease to severe disease in the foot. And I, almost all previous studies in, quote, no option patients excluded even renal failure patients. This is pretty dramatic to, um, to have these kind of results. And again, they can probably be improved. So how does it work? So, um, you know, I did some early ones and I got really exuberant with one and I did an immediate transmetatarsal amputation, brought the flap up, it bled great. And when I took the dressing down at three days, the entire flap had necrosed. And I obviously didn't understand how this procedure worked, but we know more now. So what have you learned about how to take care of these feet? Well, I, I, that's definitely a work in progress. Um, one of the most beautiful things about this entire project has been the collaborative work that we've all had. From the very beginning, you have all these bright people, not only from the US, actually from around the world, uh, and we had constantly just bounced ideas off of each other, trying to understand further in depth what was going on. And one of the things that we came to understand, based on some objective data, because the Alps registry had shown us before the PROMISE-2 study, that uh, after four weeks, and even more so after six weeks, the transcutaneous oxygen pressures would go up on these patients. 
And so one thing that we realized as a group was, hey, these patients are not gonna be the, like the normal arterial, arterial reconstructions where you could go literally the next day and do some procedure and you're already gonna get good wound healing. But there is a phase of what I call maturity. So you do the procedure on time zero and then you kind of sit on the, on the situation. Ideally, if there's no infection or no severe pain, you can wait a little period, let this mature, and usually by four weeks or even more so six weeks, we actually recommend to start doing some degree of foot reconstruction if needed. And if the wounds are small enough, actually normally just waiting on those patients, they start progressing very quickly after that time frame. Yeah, I think the other point is these patients were end stage. So if you use whether, either you use Rutherford or Wi-Fi, they were the most advanced of those two groups. And they really were looked at by teams that were excellent both at open conventional revascularization and complex endo, and they weren't found to be candidates for either group. So we talked, Dan, earlier about other diseases that might lend themselves to this. One was Berger's disease. The other is the occasional patient you see who's had multiple emboli, and they've wiped out their outflow, but they don't quite have a dead foot yet. So you've had any experience with either of those groups? So uh, I have not, in, in my practice, uh, treated Berger's patients with this. Uh, Thankfully, we've been able to keep the Burgers patients from smoking, uh, but in, in fact of matter, I've seen reports of it being successful there. I have treated patients who've had multiple emboli, likely over an extended period of time, and uh, I think you know we talked just a little bit earlier about the fact that the patient I recently did with this problem had a much more dramatic improvement in their tissue oxygenation as evidenced by wound healing much earlier than the four to six week pattern. I think as we move forward with this technology and this technique, we're going to find additional groups of patients who are gonna have very different responses and potentially much more improved outcomes even than what we're seeing right now. I mean, I think it's important to remember this technique the reports on this technique now, we're talking about 100 to 150 patients. There's a lot for us to learn and a lot for us to improve in terms of outcomes. And the outcomes in, in PROMISE 2 are similar to PROMISE 1, but these were a whole new set of investigators. There were no roll-in patients, and I expect that we will only see improved outcomes from this point forward. So the other thing you have to understand, so most of us when we trained did not learn much about the venous anatomy of the foot and that is critical to getting these procedures to work. So can you cover maybe some key points? How do you know that you've got an adequate initial revascularization? And then do all these patients need to go back for touch-ups to either, either embolize um, vessels that may be stealing flow from the foot or optimizing flow into the deep fortress of the foot, as the Italians call it? The first phase of this, when we started scratching our heads and trying to understand this, was really going back to the anatomy books. And, and even in the anatomy books that we're used to, we, we don't have exuberant slides or images about how the anatomy of the foot works. So uh, it's been a lot of digging into a lot of old literature to try to further understand. And one of the biggest problems, technically speaking, is that you would be able to arterialize to the ankle, but the lateral plantar vein that feeds the posterior tibial vein, which is the one that you're arterializing, has in itself four or five valves. And if those valves aren't dealt with, then all that flow just goes back. And the idea is the more forward flow you have, the more pressurized arterial flow you have into the distal uh, fortress and into the very uh, distal small vessels of the foot, the better those patients do. And so I think we've learned already that there are a multitude, a multitude of levels of venous anatomy, that there is certainly a very intimate relationship between the superficial venous system and the deep venous system. And I hope uh, that as we progress, we learn more on how to not only mature it quickly, uh, like Dr. Claire said, uh, but focalize it into specific regions where the foot really requires a quick uh, reoxygenation of the tissues. Yeah, the other thing I wanted you to both to comment on, so we've, some of these patients heal and then their limb flow procedure, their venous arterialization goes down. And yet, sometimes when you look at the foot, if it's gotten to a certain stage, it appears to be revascularized and the wound keeps healing. And we've had occasion to angio a few, usually for their contralateral leg when it goes bad, and we've taken a peek at the other side, and we see these what look like new arterial vessels that weren't there before. And have you seen that? And what do you think? Are these uh, Lejar's plexus that have become arterialized, or are these new vessels, or what, what, how do you explain that? I'm sure you've seen it. <laughs> I, I, I think we've all seen it. I wish we could explain it. 
uh, whether this is angiogenesis or an alternative strategy to fill the very distal arterioles in the foot or a venous plexus that's arterialized, I can't say for sure, but it is clear that long-term patency of these is not what we see in vein bypass grafts to this group of patients. And if they're beyond six months, I have stopped doing reinterventions for that uh, for this procedure because in most of those patients, there's adequate arterialization. And many of these patients will have adequate arterialization for years after the procedure is done. It's uh, I wish we understood this better, and I think as we do, we'll probably be able to, again, be better at the way we do this. So another thing we learned, so I talked about my mistake bringing a flap up early. So um, Miguel and, and one of our podiatrists have actually worked together a lot, and it sounds, it sounds kind of a dinosaur operation, but they started doing basically guillotine transmetatarsal amputations for advanced forefoot ischemia and not even trying to close them initially. And one of the things about that that's really advantageous is the patient, since they don't have a flap, they can actually walk on it. So I think for some of these patients, it offers them a better life, even though they have an open wound. So you let them walk on it with a boot, and then at some point you go back and you cover it either with matrix or eventually a skin graft. But how did you think of that? Because most of us, when we do these, these um, tenuous foot procedures, we tend to always keep the patient off of it. But to me, this is quite dramatic. It was really an uh, evolution of, of the need that we had. And, and, and really, to, to Dan's point, I hope that that's not where we stop. I hope that the solution is not we're going to chop the toes of everybody that has this. Uh, but certainly, some people that are already committed due to the aggressiveness of the disease, the extension of the necrotic tissue, we're almost like bound to have to do that procedure anyway. And some of these cases do have a little bit of swelling since you're you know, altering some of the hemodynamics of the venous system. And that swelling leads to a lot of dehiscence of primary closures. And that's what we did. And, and to your point exactly, we were really content when we look at that data that actually rehab was able to walk these patients with an average time of two days, which I think has to probably do uh, with a lot of how good these patients feel and how their mental health, I think, could be uh, you, you know, improved dramatically through these things. Because these patients, remember, have been sometimes bedridden for months since alternatives. Yeah, and then you come and you give them hope and you give them some possibilities and things start moving along. So it's been an option. I, I certainly hope that we get better and better at recruiting the more distal veins because that they're, they're in probably lazy, the, you know, the, the alternative to how to keep intact some of the distal forefoot and not have to remove it. We tend to try to pursue all the conventional options first. And I think in some of these patients, we do them a disservice because we delay getting them to, you know, their, their foot gets worse while we're trying last resort pedal endo. So I'm hoping we can come up with some selection criteria based on some combination of imaging and maybe MAC and maybe pedal acceleration time to try to figure out this patient really is, it may not look quite like a no option patient, but it is, and you better just go with this option up front. I think, don't you see that sometimes I, where we wait too long? I definitely agree with you. I think even in some of the patients we enrolled in Promise 2, I had tried to do either dead end angioplasties or tried to get into pedal vessels that were so calcified and diseased, they would have been better off with this initially. I think we have to consider not calling these patients no option because I truly believe we, we do have an option now and we can offer it to them. And I think there'll be, there'll be fewer and fewer patients that truly have no option, so these will become the venous option patients. So anyway, I'd like to thank you both for being here. These are two of, the, two of the greatest people in the world that are doing this procedure, so if you have questions, seek them out or seek the Italian group out with Dr. Cassini and Dr. Ferrarese. There's some really good folks that have thought a lot about this.